so thanks for all the wonderful talks uh, you presented from your personal experiences and from the experiences of your companies. Um, so I would like to uh, start with uh, uh, we we are uh, we are seeing three main uh, models which are coming out in the infrastructure space. One is uh, hyper converge, one is multi cloud, and one is private only kind of infrastructures. So. Uh, what do you think about how the way infrastructure, I mean, there used to be a time where most of the customers or most of the clients used to have one single vendor for all their needs, but right now you see there's a diverse, um, and diverse applications uh, and people are having homegrown, uh, homegrown, company, uh, homegrown softwares for their own needs. And like, like the ones which dominated the industry about a decade ago, Microsoft, uh, even companies like Red Hat or Apple don't seem to have a space here and companies like Netflix, uh, Uber and companies like that have uh, have a name in infrastructure space. How do you see the transition going on? Definitely, uh, uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, innovation happening from the tech space, and at this age, uh, there are uh, a lot of open source coming up, right? So they are able to share with the community and just uh, work uh, uh, across the companies to deliver some product. Uh, like uh, uh, I mentioned, Lyft Envoy. So it's been uh, uh, done by multiple. Uh, Companies still been open source by Lyft, but a lot of companies actually contributed to it. Definitely, uh, uh, these new product companies are becoming the new tech uh, innovators uh, in the space. And uh, and also when you talk about the multi cloud, right? So there are uh, some pre built services for each cloud. Uh, yeah, most featured or feature rich is AWS, but. Uh, I say some things are uh, better done by other uh, public clubs. Like Google has uh, a good RTS system where recent the Spotify shifted from it. So uh, you shouldn't say that we can just go and stick with one public club because there is something which is offering at the same cost and doesn't get better. So we should just go and uh, get most of it. Or uh, you can say that, let's say, Azure gives you 100k credit. Why don't you waste? Why do you need to waste the hundred credits? Right? You just need to go and do it. When you containerize a lot of workloads, or uh, the other guys are giving the system with better performance, we should definitely go for it. Yeah, and, and I think uh, uh, personally, one of the things I would probably have liked to see in the morning uh, uh, sessions, or probably in the next discussions that we have. Uh, is spot text, right? So it's 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 been one of the leading, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the myth breaker into this entire multi cloud arena. It essentially pioneered the entire spot system in AWS and said, hey, "Look, here we are. Like we can help you make sense of the spot system, right? It, it's um, again uh, like a lot of people innovated uh, with a lot of." Uh, uh, let's say scripts and so on, just to figure out how to make sense of the spot system and reduce your cost and so on. And spot, if, uh, uh, spot ends, uh, sorry. So it essentially like changed the game uh, uh, on its head. And it said, to look, I we can make sense of this entire spot system. And that was the initial thrust. And later on, what they did is like, they also said, we can take the same approach everywhere, right? You can literally plug in uh, spot ends to any infrastructure part. That is one of the new thrust areas as far as this entire multi cloud approach uh, 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 is uh, coming out to be. And part of the reason is because of uh, 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 the stateless containers in Docker and Rancher and Spotlight's kind of people who are essentially acting as a multi cloud broker, so to speak. Right? They are essentially building in a catalog of services and uh, you can run your multi cloud app. So that has uh, Led to the spot of this multi cloud deployments, whereas even like a couple of years back, you didn't have this much, this many multi cloud deployments, so to speak. Yeah, so my uh, thoughts also was exactly the same. So, previously, when we were building the product, we were more focused on 
getting things to work. Then recently, about six months back, we increased the team and then we found out that we now have a separate team who can handle uh, the scaling issues, all the uh, trying out these buttons. So we are we use buttons to handle as well free right. So uh, this kind of multi cloud approach is now possible for us and uh, we we are heavily into AWS but we do want to start looking into uh, Google Cloud or Azure for the features that they offer, not only the it couldn't it's not just the credits panels but the features that offer that they offer also. So for example Azure's uh, post DB right so it has uh, you can literally replicate your data across continents and so on. So those kind of features are uh, it is more useful for some of the products that we build. So those are those two features are more important and when you have a better provider to provide those kinds of features, it's uh, it makes sense to shift to that. So it's it's going to happen. And so this brings to the next question, what is the cost of this innovation? I mean there's always a cost. I mean uh, most of the people in operations or DevOps tend to see a cost benefit rather than pros and cons. So, what is the cost which the developers will take or the DevOps will take in this? True. So, the cost is um, to give an example, right? So, I've seen a lot of startups have their own way of handling problems. I think uh, Index has their own method, and uh, if I remember right, in GoodConf Bangor, there was Mapbox or some of the startup had their own way of handling these kind of uh, spot and since management. And we also said, okay, it makes sense to build such a uh, tool. But when we saw spot and it made sense, okay, this is so easy to set up. Why should we even worry building such a thing out of uh, all the, we have to spend a few months to build it and then uh, test it and we have to maintain all those things. So that is, uh, that, that is the cost we want to avoid and if this is just a plug and play, uh, DevOps uh, guy was able to set spot and steady and it was running in less than a few, uh, two or three days, right? So that is uh, an advantage for us. So that, I think it, uh, it's useful to have ready-made uh, things available also. But we do, uh, like, the important thing to note here is we we are basically a computer vision and AI startup, right? So our primary IP belongs in this. And we don't use AWS machine learning uh, tools or those kind of uh, things. So we build our own models, all those things. So our IP, we make sure that we develop it and we protect it. But these kind of infrastructure things, we are not too, uh, at this stage of the company, at least we are not too heavily spending time or resources on that, that is uh, great. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I would like, uh, I, I like that bit, Kiran, uh, when you said in the morning that the first thing you guys were actually testing in a data setup was the noisy neighborhood problem and uh, uh, that again brings me to that again cost of innovation thing. So, I have seen studies and papers and scripts where people have written how to do predictable uh, instance firing and they set the shoulders to figure out what is my ideal instance and add that to the cluster. So that to me uh, is like a lack of focus on the fundamental problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, the, it's a cliche thing but Elon Musk's first principles, he says like, look, what are you trying to solve is the first fundamental question that you have to answer. Now there are very very simple solutions like you said like we just made uh, a choice to go dedicated for that particular infra and be done with it. You don't have to innovate for that particular context and I can point out that literally not just on AWS, this is like across clouds where people uh, uh, basically like innovate for the sake of innovating without adding any real value and that can actually take your focus away from the actual problems that you want to solve. And uh, uh, again uh, coming back to the, uh, the cost of innovation, so uh, here is one question that we ask internally uh, which is like what is the cost of cutting cost? Right, so that's like a food for thought for most people. Like, at what price do you want to save cost? So that, if you are able to answer that, it helps you with your product planning and so on. So the cost of innovation, even trying out the multi-cloud, right? So uh, I don't think so. We need to go and just break 
break down your app and put some part in your another cloud and some part here, right? As a growing company in anything, so you'll be keep adding the infrastructures. So whether it can be your marketing services, maybe uh, at the uh, say in the starting stage of your stress, you don't have anything for the insights. So right now we use a, a very uh, extensive HCFC solution where anybody in the company can see the same things so like how many tickets are growing, how many nodes are created, how many customers are there. Uh, those kind of insights to do the capacity. So those kind of things you can have the workflow and try it out on the other tables. So you don't need to essentially add up other cost uh, incentive. I would say that when you are actually trying out a new cloud for the smaller uh, it, it actually runs for free. Instead of uh, running in your AWS and putting up another stack, doing the same thing, you can you can very well try Azure or GCP and try out so that if you fail it, so you are not going to incur anything because you can just apply. It's not a very critical service where you are running. It's a new service where you are trying it out. You can very well try it out. And uh, the next question um, in this whole uh, speaking about cost. Uh, at what point do you think the company would move away from cloud services and go to the private infrastructure? Uh, so, to be frank, maybe I will. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you have the sophistication of an R and D an experimentation on the cloud, uh, I, I would say that uh, it will be the reverse. So, people always wants to come to the cloud rather than having their own infrastructure. Uh, like uh, if even our competitors where they uh, maintain their own data center, they started going to the cloud now. Maybe they started before AWS is so popular or GCP is so popular. But uh, for the sophistication we have, and say it's easy to get a certification even for a company when you are running on the cloud because they take care of all the physical uh, checks on their side, right? You don't need to maintain all these things. And uh, yeah, if you are building a company from India uh, for the global market, it's an like fresh desk, not uh, uh, any particular region is on focus, you need to maintain two different things because uh, building a data center in India is a bit of a challenge, right? So you won't have that gigabits of uh, uh, bandwidth available for free, and which is reliable. Free is another thing, right? Which is reliable is a different story. Uh, so having a two different trains in two geo locations maintaining it, I don't think so. It's kind of uh, I, I would say never say no, but uh, still I feel uh, public cloud uh, will will be the future rather than keeping your own infra. Yeah, I think uh, um, uh, it will not be a one size fits all approach uh, for sure. Uh, because we still see the big players again going back to the uh, the private cloud. So I mean, uh, the the private cloud uh, it's actually a misnomer if you ask me these days. The private cloud is essentially dedicated public cloud for you. That it is right. So it's not really like you are racking stacking servers anymore, buying and so on. So you are just going to talk to a big player and say, hey, look, like Flipkart is doing. Or Mitra did some time back and so on. So they'll go to some provider and say, like, look, uh, we need like a thousand boxes. They can, they'll get the entire thing done. So it's more of a, uh, uh, essentially like a uh, dedicated public cloud for you. But I think the, the good question to answer is like, what kind of workloads uh, you want to be uh, reaching to be able to justify the hybrid existence of your uh, dedicated public cloud into a pure play public cloud because one thing is like if you go to even AWS or uh, Azure or GCP like if you get like a fairly dedicated public cloud essentially an RI is a private cloud right uh, in this uh, purest commercial sense an RI is a private cloud you, you don't you can't do anything with it it's almost like you have signed a contract with a physical uh, vendor so it's, it's almost like a private cloud for you but I think the real question is K, what kind of cost spurt is there which justifies bursting into the public space and by definition public as in the multi-cloud space. So that uh, every organization will have to figure that number out. There are 
like you said, but, uh, uh, there are organizations, customer facing, which face like incessant loads. For example, Netflix is probably one of the big examples of incessant loads on his uh, server always. So you never have a dull moment in Netflix's operations life. This is what a lot of people log and so on. So it will it will be different for different customers. It, it might be different for uh, a, a, a company like Matchstreet. Then it, it might be different for everyone's profile. So I think the the question would be: to What percentage of your workload is going to be fairly static, which you are going to convert it into an either a, a private cloud or like a a, a semi private cloud, as in an RI or like a, a fairly dedicated instances and so on. So I think that is the uh, probably the question for. Uh, lot of us. Yeah, so I also agree. Uh, Ninety-nine percent of the time, uh, share public cloud if you want to use this stuff, right? So that works ninety-nine percent of the time. And unless you have very specific needs, like uh, any kind of performance, you want to the transmit of performance or those kind of things, then only you need to work that. But the flexibility that Amazon or DC, those kind of players provide. And the ability to uh, spin up a few hundreds of thousands of nodes immediately—that that that is uh, a thing that you can't get in your own private. Right? But uh, to say about the performance part, uh, there are a few use cases that would need uh, this because we have been trying to do some uh, benchmarking of our. Uh, video processing on GPU and all those things, right? So <coughs> there are a few use cases where uh, the virtualization layer has slowed down a lot of things. And uh, we feel that only those specific pieces, we, it would make sense to move out of uh, cloud provider into having its own dedicated boxes or things like that. So, but those use cases are very, very uh, limited and you know, any kind of, uh, most of the other use problems can be solved using uh, Amazon or uh, GC. So, yes. so another question is uh, the we, we have seen a lot of change in the culture between the developers and the operations over the last decade, and now it's become uh, <coughs> there has been some kind of a truce now before it used to be all you know so almost fighting against both zeros or things like that. So. How, uh, personally, how has the DevOps experience, I mean the term was also coined DevOps, so how is the, how is the whole uh, culture shift within your own organizations, or within the developers and uh, operations? Uh, so, so, personally I have been uh, involved mostly on both sides right from the beginning. For more than a decade I have been doing both ops and dev. Uh, and a lot of times I see people coming in and saying uh, I'm a DevOps guy and uh, I ask them what, what uh, kind of development have you done I say I just handle the servers. So it's kind of a uh, funny thing right. So a uh, lot of people say they are DevOps but they don't do the dev part of it. They don't develop the tools or things that are needed. I think uh, uh, or personally I have been doing both sides of the things of both the and also have been handling all the infrastructure and as well as building the products. So there's been a mix for me all along the my life to all the startups. So yeah. So uh, uh, for a startup when I started right so there is no other group you you will be forced to do the app so yeah. <laughs> there is no no reason you can't say that I will go and recruit an ops guy. Right? Your CEO will kick you. So you need to. Somebody needs to pick up the ops and start learning it. Uh, but uh, as I told in the talk, right? So now we came to age. There is no difference between your code and your infra. Until unless you know how your infra works, or there are. This is what is there in the infra where you can actually architect something, right? So you can't say that okay, I. Uh, you like to architect some some uh, key value store and say that you you don't know Redis, you can't start with the Redis. 
So uh, you, you know that the Redis will be there, Redis will be on a cluster board, it has a shattered uh, infra, and it has a high availability, all these things you need to know before you add it, yeah, your code. So uh, now there is no difference between those two. Uh, yeah, as we said, it's like uh, now if the DevOps is a world of code. So people just uh, starting with the AWS instances is, uh, so maybe it comes for a job profile, but. Uh, uh, but uh, as it is, uh, you you architect the code. You architect the code that actually works in the code. <laughs> so uh, uh, you can add only architect the code only if it actually knows how it actually has the infra aligned up for you, uh, and that, that gives you a sense of uh, achievement or whatever, right? So because you are actually taking up the ownership of uh, what's uh, being sold to the consumers. It's not like it's something wrong to the consumer. It's not some X guy is going to get caught or not. You know, so the developers needs to take care of what's what really happening over there and and start something. Yeah, I think Aaron uh, uh, Spots, uh, the owner of the Pakona guys, uh, who is doing the startup for Vivid Cortex. He, I think, recently went on Twitter. He said, okay, "The DevOps as a term is dead. You know, don't use it anymore." So. Uh, uh, but uh, to be fair, what I have seen, uh, let's say the last five years is that there has been a tremendous improvement in understanding of operational concepts from the developer side, not necessarily the other way. So that has been slightly a trend these days, like you have developers who are so interested in like the infrastructure, wanting to know more about it. Uh, and part of it is also that they are being forced to because you essentially have distributed components these days. Like, I, I don't think any fresh organization is coming up and doing a monolithic architecture anymore, right? So uh, that's all legacy, no one is doing that. So I think one of the good positive change this has brought in is like, the developers have like a real solid understanding of how uh, the ops world uh, runs and so on, but not necessarily the other way. I think uh, the other way it's still calling themselves DevOps and not really trying to figure out uh, the programming paradigms, what are the pitfalls if this happens and so on. So that has been kind of a slight shortcoming from the operational side uh, uh, in terms of uh, no one has tried any real effort to understand how Golang works, right? So although the other side there has been a tremendous effort, so I think the, the sysadmin world, the typical system admin needs to step up as well, go into the uh, dev world more rather than just calling themselves a dev because they write scripts. That is not a functional role anymore, right? So they have to go deep into the, the dev world, understand how uh, the latest stacks works and so on. So uh, if you were to go pick uh, three or four technologies which uh, you were really interested in solve a lot of a lot of your problems over the past, I mean, the, the problems which are solved, what would they be? Like uh, technologies like uh, you know, deep learning, computation, computation management, uh, it, it could be anything like even popular tools or you know obscure tools which uh, people might not have used in their stacks. Um, uh, giving it to the DevOps. Uh, yeah, yeah. Context. So uh, one thing we use a lot is Ansible. Basically, we love the whole Ansible. Previously, I used to have Puppet and. I tried shift a bit and it was horrible to think in that kind of a way. So Ansible made sense for us. Also it's research and you can easily build your, uh, you can write your, so that was one good thing that happened. And uh, I think in terms of monitoring, uh, in terms of monitoring, um, uh, we personally use uh, different kinds of things. So Elk stack is one thing that we use a lot, and uh, we also have our own uh, uh, InfluxDB cluster and uh, the tick stack, right? So, InfluxDB and Kibana, Grafana, Grafana. And uh, these are the two things that we use on the monitoring side. But I have heard a lot of good things that are coming out uh, in terms of Prometheus, right? So, I do want to go into that and see how it is working, but I haven't yet had the so these are yeah, this is our these are monitoring systems. And uh, what about the uh, uh, container orchestration systems for Kubernetes and Windows? Uh, yeah, so uh, 
for work, we don't use Kubernetes yet. We use AWS uh, ECS. But personally, I have been playing around with Kubernetes and the way it has been, the LDF project itself is amazing. The community is also great. And uh, it's so easy to start your own, start your services and uh, deploy it on the cloud. And it's quite easy. So I think we would want to have, uh, if AWS has uh, something like GC does for Kubernetes, it would be a great feature. And uh, maybe that could be one reason why we might shift to GC2 that is also available. So uh, I think Kubernetes is a great project if anyone can. Yeah, I, th I think uh, I've got to second that Kubernetes is something that has made a massive difference. Uh, probably, like I said, slightly in GC2 versus I had, uh, like from, uh, let's say, your new source and so on. Like, there's a clear pattern emerging uh, that Kubernetes is the way to go. But having said that, uh, I've been most impressed with uh, two things. In fact, one is Rancher, which is essentially a, a meta of uh, the Kubernetes world. So there you can essentially manage any container platform and make sense of uh, essentially everything that you need in a container orchestration platform and supports multi-cloud out of the box. So that has given like a real boost uh, to at least the stateless container deployments that I have seen. And the uh, other two important things that I have seen, which has not been probably as much talked about is, uh, one is the, uh, the Cloudera uh, stuff for uh, the, uh, essentially the map reduce requirements and your big data requirements. So not much uh, traction, but I've, you've seen like very good results with people uh, who have used that. Uh, that's again like a very very good open source project so a lot of traction and so on um, apart from that there is a small tool uh, uh, which uh, always goes hand in hand with me whenever i speak of elk i always say elastolite so uh, you can never run a, a organized uh, elk system without elastolite so it's like one of the most underrated piece of uh, add-on equipment for any tool so you can do like lots of analytics itself, do like lots of regular expressions, counting, mathematical functions, everything can be done in the last alert itself and you can make sense of the data rather than just team those data in. So that's for what I saw. Uh, so for us it's uh, Elasticsearch. So we use for many, many different things. We use for monitoring, uh, we use for our own search and we use even as an uh, data store where we can generate uh, even the graphs, dashboards for our customers. So it's not for ops use case. Uh, so uh, because an RD business can only scale when you do an M to M Cartesian, right? Only for some level. But uh, if you knock off page, uh, the page nation, Elastic Search can give you what all, uh, what not the RD business gives you, right? So then they have. Uh, uh, piece of it, and uh, um, we are very thankful for Redis. So Redis actually we use it a lot. So uh, I mean, without Redis uh, having to store our state or to store the cache or anything, so we use Redis. So uh, we used in a cluster environment, and uh, I would say Terraform. Terraform is that uh, we are actually scaling on the template inside. It's pretty easy to write the uh, uh, Terraform for a developer uh, because it's easy to understand, okay, I want this properties, I want this uh, this configuration, this is how I, I like to look at my stack, uh, those kind of things. And uh, for, for the past uh, four years, I would say Opsworks, AWS Opsworks. So that is our predominant deployment tool. Uh, uh, for GCP, we use Kubernetes. But uh, Oxford is where we are running everything. So uh, we use that as a configuration service. We use for our deployments, for the management, and for everything. Uh, do the audience have any questions to your panelists? Uh, so how do you guys typically manage uh, your development invest investment on the for the development? Uh, do you still prefer to host your dev infrastructure on AWS or not in your big clouds, or you prefer to have a local setup which sort of mimics the production environment? Uh, 
So uh, I work for uh, RCCM. So what we typically do is uh, we write wrappers around most of the common uh, APIs that are available, and uh, we sort of have a internal versions of all these things. Uh, though they don't give the same performance levels or anywhere close to the the one production environment is going to give us, but at least uh, that will help us to save a lot of dev cost when it comes to uh, when it comes to the development. So what is the practice that you guys follow for your development? Address and trust us, um, trust us. So, so we, uh, for the dev, we don't keep AWS. So we actually try to mimic as much as AWS we can. But there are slight out of uh, uh, services where you don't need to mimic what AWS does, right? So it's like, say, a Rails uh, uh, deployment can, uh, it's like running on your bare metal if it is running on your Mac. There won't be any difference whether it runs on your EC2 or runs on your, uh, runs on your machine. So for those things, we don't need to mimic, but we mimic something like an SQS and uh, a DynamoDB, those kind of things. We, we, we typically use uh, a lot of uh, uh, open source by Netflix uh, and also uh, Spotify, Shopify, sorry, Shopify. Uh, so where they have uh, okay the new uh, the same thing how we discuss if they have it uh, open source which does the same work. Uh, yeah, I'm slightly opinionated uh, on this. So uh, as a principle, nobody should be having servers locally. So this is what uh, we think. So uh, and and uh, frankly the. The cost of power, electricity, and the real estate of running these racks and so on. So I once saw like a conference room in Brigade Road, Bangalore, full of servers, two three racks. Right, that area rent for one month could have bought those servers for like one year fully. So it this the economics of it doesn't make sense, and you also need like additional system admin supports and so on. So you are far better off. On the uh, probably on the same cloud, or if uh, at least like uh, 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 on an alternate cloud at least, but it should be as close to production as possible. So I've 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 seen people like use uh, a bit of background and so on and so forth on their uh, local laptops. That's the only thing that should run within your office. Anything you want to host and make it accessible, my belief is that it should be on probably the same infra uh, that your production run. If you have your uh, production on AWS using like 10 micro uh, managed services from AWS, your state should exactly replicate that 10 microservices is what we have seen because otherwise it ends up uh, complicating the dev cycles because uh, there are so many regressions that can happen because somebody assumed something was there in the uh, staging which did exist in production. So, Lot of such regressions happen, and the, the cost benefits that you get eventually, if you look at it as a holistic package, is not worth it. Yeah, uh, so for me, when I say it's local, it's on your Mac. Ah, yeah, exactly. So that's the max you can, otherwise, though, it should go to the data center. Yeah. So, our experience is also similar. Like, uh, previously, I used to use Python. Now, as we have started using uh, Docker Compose to have all the Java applications or those kind of things, right? But when we need to interface with anything that AWS provides, like you said, SQS or DynamoDB, uh, we do put it on the on the dev server on the cloud, and then we do a dev run. So we haven't yet tried those kind of. Uh, there are I know that there are a few open source libraries which can mimic the SQS or Dynamo or S3. Those are there, but we haven't we haven't yet tried them out. But uh, Putting it on AWS and uh, running it, it's much more easier and uh, you can just run it after a few hours, you can shut it, you are done. So, it, there's no uh, cost associated with that, but uh, this is something that uh, is, it depends on your style, right? So, if you want to have everything on local and test it, then you would want this. But there are a few services that even our microservices itself, there are a few pieces that are very heavyweight and we cannot run that on local, normal Mac, uh, Mac servers. Right? So, in those cases, we definitely have to go local. Can you talk about the 
Anyways, you know. Okay, so um, I mean, I've been hearing a lot about Kubernetes since morning and off late on internet as well. Uh, so, couple of questions. So, do you guys who run production workloads in containers, haven't you had any issues with Docker whatsoever? Hasn't it been causing any kernel panics or any sort of issues that brings down your infrastructure? Or does it just work out of the box like 100% of the time? Uh, so, uh, I've seen some fairly large deployments on uh, standalone dockers, forget even about uh, Kubernetes and so on. So, um, in fact, the last uh, conference tech I had, there was like a heated discussion on why uh, the Docker monitoring is not as good as it can potentially be. And we started from that problem, and which is how uh, uh, we came across uh, Rancher as a, a piece itself. So. One of the things that it does, it, it treats every uh, container, which is obviously stateless, as mutable. So once you have that determination, and once you are able to uh, kill any Docker container at your own will, then you solve the problem, right? The first thing that can happen is like, your Docker is not responsive, and if you leave at it, it will eventually bring the entire machine down. So if you are able to preempt that from happening, and the first sign of that is, that Docker stops responding to your uh, HTTP or whatever API request that you have. Now, if your orchestration solution at a container level is going to say, okay, look, by my health check, this container is down, that should be the first time you kill that container or restart that container or just kill it and launch one more thing. If you are able to proactively do this, you will not face exponential degradation with Docker bringing other Dockers and so on. So that is one big learning that uh, we have had with this. Second thing is, I think the limit setting with uh, 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 the latest kernels in terms of how much resources uh, a Docker can use is much more rigorous than probably when Docker started out. So you are able to essentially localize the problem to a local Docker now, much better than uh, uh, let's say like a, a couple of years back. So that has helped. Uh, your experiences. Yeah. So, uh, from our experience, we don't use Docker for too, too uh, uh, heavy things. So, we haven't faced this kind of problems. But to give you an uh, example on the non Docker side, right? Uh, if you remember Batman, right? It is a memory intensive process. And uh, the naturally, it's going to have memories and it's going to go and stop responding. So it has happened a lot and it keeps happening and the easiest solution is what he said, kill that machine and move on to the next mission. Treat your servers or treat your infrastructure as scattered and not best, right? So you have other machines, other uh, servers ready, other containers ready and then you don't have to worry about uh, this being in a non-responsive state. So that's the I mean, solution. My primary thing is when you have such issues, right? Uh, you can still get away with the resource limits problem by using C2s. I necessarily yeah. don't have to use Docker. So that is why I feel, I mean, it's a personal opinion, Mesos is a very underrated tool because it helps you run non-container deployments with all the resource constraints that Docker gives. One of our primary reasons why I am not a huge fan of Kubernetes is because I can't run non-Docker, non-container stuff on Kubernetes. Where, whereas my Mesos Marathon stuff, I can do that. And now with the latest version, I have all the notions of pods, I have all the notions of code deployments, I have this ingress controller equivalent there. Every all features the Kubernetes fancy home gives me with just the container abstraction. I get everything without the container. So I have, I mean, and also the other big thing is your containers, people say it's easy to package every deployments together and say it together. But as an organization, you don't change your stack so often. It's, it's only a practical thing that in a single organization, you don't run like 20 or 30 different stacks that you actually need a notion of an image, that you need a notion of a complete isolated stack. And you would obviously want to use three or four languages maximum, that itself is going to go out of hand if you use four. And your stack or the versioning will also be on par for most of the cases. Something like Heroku build packs work most of the times. So where does this whole notion of containers, I mean I understand, I'm a huge fan of cattles. I'm a huge fan of resource limitations that C groups offers, but not a huge fan of containers. Because they force me to use something, especially uh, a system that's running in production, 
which has thousands of issues open on GitHub. And a common response they get is upgrade your kernel, upgrade your operating system. As an ops person, that's not a feasible solution for me. Every time I upgrade, you're asking me to upgrade my kernel version and my operating system version. Not so, I'm not a huge fan of that. So how do you sort of promote or how do you guys accept using a system like that in production? I, of course, there are good user stories, um, use cases where Docker is successful. But I don't know if everybody is going to have the same set of experience. So do you guys have any thoughts or feelings on that? Uh, like I said, uh, uh, it's not just about uh, the deployment and the, uh, the scaling up perspective uh, in itself. Uh, container, uh, the way I see it, it, it's more of a paradigm for the entire uh, dev cycles to run through and so on. And uh, I've seen places where uh, there are about 70, 80 microservices and so on. Uh, in fairly large organization, uh, you might have one single language. You don't even have to go three, four languages. But I've still seen cross-functional teams have better coordination and local localization of problems with microservices. So that is one of the biggest pushers for uh, change in the container world. Because uh, let's take these examples of the, uh, let's say someone who is running a top 50 Alexa site. Right? So he has like potentially 300 developers. Right? Now, to achieve a certain sense of coordination and to ensure that one guy's commit does not break other guy's uh, uh, code. So those, well, of course, you can track them and project management or stuff and there and so on. But it's essentially localization of the problem via microservices, which lends itself for much better auditing and trackability. And I think that is probably the reason why Docker in itself is so popular. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think apart from that, the newer generation tools, like for example, if you look at uh, Rancher, it essentially doesn't care whether the underlying infra is Docker, right? So uh, I think it, it essentially becomes like a package to you. You can even run a big binary uh, like your uh, Go and so on, right? Or you can run your resource infrastructure. Uh, so I think Docker as a, or, or the container in itself, it's just another of those phenomenon Five years down the line, we might not have what it is today, right? But I think the overall concepts of having mutable instances and being able to deploy them and package them in a very, very proficient and uh, basically like at a rapid clip from zero to thousand. So those are the fundamental uh, paradigms which will stay. And people will learn from Docker and it will just like any other technology, probably like five years, ten years down the line, it might not exist the way that we see today. But the learnings of mutable uh, instances, rapid provisioning of uh, uh, containers via uh, pods or whatever, those are the main concepts in a multi-cloud world that will stay. Rather than the actual, uh, like you said, uh, it's like a very tricky uh, uh, GitHub issues page if you see, right? So, but a lot of people do work with it and I've seen like fairly uh, top 10, top 20 sites run on Docker and so on. So not major problems as such. So it's not as bad as the, the comments or the issues page looks like, but it's still something that is still is a work in progress. Nobody can say Docker is so mature. That's for sure. So uh, one of the things which I have observed is, uh, so uh, we, we re uh, redistribute Kubernetes as OpenShift uh, in the tank. Uh, so uh, this is the thing, the, the adoption of it is growing, uh, as in uh, people want to try it out, but uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, if, you, if you take a look at the number of top applications that people are trying to run on a container orchestration system are stateful applications, like your databases and all. So there, there has been problems, but also the thing is, uh, they, uh, the community is pretty open and uh, you, you're getting uh, it's a growing community and people are trying to solve these problems together. Uh, like if you take a look at uh, the communities which have grown around Kubernetes with CNCF and they have been standardizing processes around uh, what these interfaces need to look like and what what's the response time from each, uh, I mean these API calls and so uh, other companies can, uh, companies or communities can write their tools around this or adopt their tools with these uh, uh, tool. Yeah, it, it has been a paradigm shift as uh, Imran says because it's becoming more declarative in the sense that uh, 
you are not telling go provision me these systems in this data center in this place it's more like this is my requirement what do you have give this requirement to me it's like it's 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 changing for uh, the the operations people too so yes there are problems but yeah the uh, even bigger companies are throwing their weight behind these technologies and for adoption also so uh, Hopefully, uh, the kernel issues would be solved, <laughs> uh, and uh, we do not recommend the latest kernel to be there in modern production systems. Uh, uh, but we do recommend having the most stable interfaces in your production systems. If you are, uh, if you if you don't want bleeding edge in your technology stack, and uh, if stability makes more sense to you, uh, most of the governments or financial companies uh, usually they say uh, there used to be a saying that use the n minus two version of this one, so it's it's more stable. Don't use the end version of anything. So, yeah. But if you take a look at it, uh, uh, container orchestration systems are uh, giving confidence to people for running the end version itself. Nobody is packaging it into a Debian package or Arkin package anymore. They are directly deploying their GitHub uh, source codes to containers and then taking it to production. So this is what I guess. So. Uh, any other questions? Not, uh, thanks for your time. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for sharing your experiences and discussion.